Hello and welcome to episode 3 of Chemistry in 15 Minutes or Less. My name is Audra, and this review session is on chapter 3, Early Atomic Theory. While atomic theory does begin in 1667, we do need to talk about a man in 470 BC. His name was Democritus, and he was the first person to use the term atom to mean something indivisible. However, we don't have a lot to talk about as far as modern advancement in the period between BC and 1667, so we start with a man by the name of Robert Boyle. His claim to fame was a book called The Skeptical Chemist, where he was one of the first scientists to start using experimental evidence to prove his points. He also was the first person to define element as we currently know it as a pure substance that cannot be broken down into smaller, simpler substances. Following him, we have a man by the name of Antoine Lavoisier. As you can tell by the name, he is a Frenchman, and he was around in 1782, which is when he created the Law of Conservation of Mass. This states that mass is neither created nor destroyed during ordinary chemical reactions or changes. He was one of the first chemists to work in a closed system, which is how he discovered that mass is not created nor destroyed during chemical reactions, as long as they are carried out under these ordinary conditions in a system like that. To build on him, we have a man by the name of Proust. His year is 1787, so just a little bit after Lavoisier, and he created what he called the Law of Definite Proportions. This states that a chemical compound contains the same elements in exactly the same proportions by mass, regardless of the sample size or compound source. This basically means if you have 10 grams of table salt from your house and 30 grams of table salt from a friend's house, they are still going to have the same ratio of sodium to chlorine. One to one. It's going to be the same no matter whose house it's from or what type of salt it is as long as it's sodium chloride. The next man we're going to talk about is one of the most important men that we're going to talk about in this video. A man by the name of John Dalton who did all of his work in the early 1800s. I don't have a specific year for him because he did so much over a span of a short period of time. Now I'm going to quickly pull away our timeline for just a second so we can talk about some of the really important things that Dalton did. First thing is the law of multiple proportions. This says that if two or more different compounds are composed of the same elements, then the ratio of the mass of one element that combines with the given mass of the other element forms in small whole numbers. You'll notice the theme with small whole number ratios. He also was one of the first to apply the particle nature of gases and Guy Lussac's theory gas law, to other forms of matter. The most important thing we need to talk about are his five postulates of atomic theory. These are, in order, one, all matter is composed of atoms. Number two, all atoms of a given element are identical in chemical and physical properties. Number three says that atoms cannot be subdivided, created, or destroyed. Four, which says atoms of different elements combine in simple whole number ratios. And five, chemical reactions combine separate, and rearrange atoms. Now applying a modern lens to these, we know that some of these things are not entirely correct. We know that number one, all matter is composed of atoms, is correct, and number two is technically correct, that all atoms of a given element are identical. However, this does not factor in isotopes, which we'll talk about in just a few seconds. Atoms cannot be subdivided, created, or destroyed. We know 
that atoms can be subdivided into electrons, protons, and neutrons, but the fact that they cannot be created or destroyed is true. As far as number four goes, atoms of different elements combining in simple whole number ratios, that is true except in a lot of organic molecules. Their ratios tend to be kind of strange and not very helpful as far as simple ratios go, and number five is correct. Moving on past Dalton's postulates of atomic theory, we have Dalton's model of the atom, which is super important because it was one of the first models of the atom. I'll we'll leave it up here, and it's just the solid model. He thought that atoms were monatomic, they were the smallest unit, and nothing else could form out of them, so then he assigned atomic masses to different elements based on the masses of reactants and products from experiments that he did, which basically means he assigned hydrogen a value of 1 and oxygen a value of 8, which you'll notice coincides with their atomic number. I am going to leave that up there, but talk about another important man by the name of Amido Avogadro. I don't need to worry about the date for him. What you need to know is Avogadro's number, which is abbreviated this way. But what it stands for is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. We'll talk about that in just a second, so we don't have to worry about discussing that now, but I'd like to bring that up just to bring your attention to it. Before we keep going to the next model of the atom, which is J.J. Thompson's model of the atom in 1904. Now his model is called the Plum Pudding Model, because his was formed after the discovery of the electron. So his looked like Dalton's model, but had a bunch of negatively charged particles suspended inside the solid model. Next up you have Ernest Rutherford's model of the atom in 1911, which is called the Nuclear Model. This was after the discovery of the proton through his gold foil experiments, where he had a thin sheet of gold foil he penetrated with alpha particles, and he noticed that some of them bounced back off of a small, dense center, and he also finally discovered that atoms are mostly empty space. So his looked more like this, giving fixed paths to the electrons. Then you have Bohr's model of the atom, which is called the planetary model, which still has the same small, dense nucleus, and then electrons in specific energy rings outside here, which we'll talk about in a later chapter. <laughs> and finally, the most current model of the atom that we still accept and use, Erwin Schrödinger's model of the atom from 1926, which is called the quantum model, which was after the discovery, which is before the discovery of protons, I believe, but has all of our electrons out here in a nice little cloud, where they're not in specific visible orbitals, but are still in energy levels, which is what we'll talk about next chapter. The last person to talk about is James Chadwick in 1932. He is the man who discovered the neutron. So some other quick things to talk about are some readings. Very simple. Let's say we have just a simple molecule of sodium here. How you would read this is this up here is your mass number. This is your atomic number and your atomic symbol. Basically, that means that there are 11 protons, and the total mass is 22. U. Now, what is a U? A U is the unified atomic mass units. The conversion factor you'll need to know for this is U to grams, which is 1.661 times 10 to the negative 24th. Some standards for atomic mass that we'll talk about while we're on the topic is it was originally based on hydrogen, was later then based on oxygen-16, but is currently based on an isotope called carbon-12. So one atom of carbon-12 is equal to exactly 12U. Now, Avogadro's number that we talked about just a second ago is coming back. It is the number of carbon atoms in 12 grams of C2, which is that 6.5. 022 times 10 to the 23rd. One final thing to talk about before we run out of time is conversions between mass, the mole, which is Avogadro's number, and just number. There are equations in here that you will need to know. Molar mass equals mass over moles. Moles equals number over Avogadro's number. You just need these for simple conversions. If you need to find the mole of something and you have the mass and the molar mass, you can rearrange that first equation. Or if you have 
the number of something, like number of atoms, for example, and need to find how many moles, you know Avogadro's number because it's a constant. To close this out, we're going to quickly discuss isotopes. An isotope is one of two or more atoms of the same element with different numbers of neutrons. They're still going to have the same number of protons because changing the number of protons changes the actual atom or element. And most elements have more than one stable isotope, at least all the ones up to bismuth. This should conclude episode 3 of Chemistry in 15 minutes or less. Feel free to leave questions or suggestions in the comments below. Be sure to follow the in-video links, check out the playlist, or head over to my channel for more videos on chemistry review. As always, I hope this helps out some of you, and have a nice night.